why was it necessary that the Lord Jesus Christ had to die? And to help provide some context to not just the answers that we're going to look at tonight, but also to provide some context to the very question that we have posed, I'd like to try and try and go through this together with you in three main sections. And so the the general structure of our of our address here tonight is going to look a bit like that. <clears throat> First we're going to look at the big problem. The very question that we have posed in our lecture title assumes there to be two things. It assumes that one, Jesus Christ did in fact die, and it also assumes that there was a reason for it, that there was a reason behind his death. And what we're going to see a little bit later on is that that reason had a, had a lot to do with providing a solution to a problem. That might sound strange. Certainly from a human perspective, it certainly sounds strange to me. It, it must be a massive problem if the solution is the death of a righteous man, if the solution is the death of a perfect man. So first we're going to establish what is that big problem that we need such a radical solution for. So we'll spend a bit of time looking at that, at the big problem as described for us in the pages of God's word. And then we'll look at what is God's solution. Once we've established what that big problem is, we'll go through some well-known scriptural verses, Bible references, and look at what God's solution was. And we'll see that he was planning to provide this solution ever since the very beginning of creation, ever since all the way back in the first three chapters of the Bible. And we will see that the death of Jesus Christ was the key to God's solution. And finally, we will very briefly look at what must we do to be saved. It's, it's great to answer the question. It's great to look at the theory. But why do we care? Why do we... Here in 2021, care about something that happened 2,000 years ago. Why do we endeavour to ask, answer the question in the first place? Because the question we will need to pose at the end of our time here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is to ask ourselves the question, what do we have to do to become beneficiaries of God's plan? What do we have to do to be saved? So that is what our evening tonight is going to look like. But before we dive right in, I'd like to just turn our minds back to the reading that was read for us in Isaiah chapter 53. You may know that Isaiah was a Hebrew prophet, a man who lived in Israel and prophesied around 700 or just over 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read through the book of Isaiah, such as Isaiah chapter 53, we find that he predominantly prophesied around the coming, the coming of, of a Messiah, the sufferings and the death of that Messiah, and finally his exaltation and resurrection. He gave prophecies around some of the details of not just the life of Jesus, but of his suffering and of his death. And that's why we read chapter 53 tonight, because we see a huge amount of detail prophesied about the things that he was going to suffer. And yet it was written 700 years or, or just over 700 years before he was even born. So we begin to see that there was something very special about this man. There was something very special about his death and the things that he was going to go through. So special that they were prophesied over 700 years before he was born. And yet many historians and modern scholars have tried their best to discredit a lot of what Isaiah had to say, just as they have with many parts of Scripture, including the very existence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That all changed with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and more, more specifically, the discovery of the Isaiah Scroll. Those discoveries put to rest a lot of the, the scepticism and it silenced many critics. 
And that's why we read Isaiah 53 tonight, because Isaiah 53 is one of those prophecies that was found that prophesy the suffering and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Isaiah scroll that was found was, was a 24-foot long scroll. It was very, very well preserved, and it contained this prophecy, it, it, and it contained the, the complete book of Isaiah itself one of the most clearest and detailed prophecies of the Messiah. And while we're on the topic of historical accuracy, I'd like to point out that, again, the, we mentioned it, but the, lecture of the, the title of the lecture assumes that we all believe in the fact that Jesus Christ did, in actual fact, die. For those of us, or for those of you who are perhaps a little less sure of that, perhaps think of it less of a historical fact and more of biblical fable, Christian fable, let's have a look at the, what the historians and the non-Christian scholars have to say on the matter. Because although there is widespread disagreement among modern scholars on the historical accuracy of specific episodes described in the Gospel record. There are at least two events that are subject to almost n no universal disagreement. There are two events that are subject to universal assent, and those two are that Jesus Christ was baptised by John the Baptist and that he was crucified by order of the Roman prefect, prefect Pontius Pilate. Have a look at what some of the historians and, and modern scholars have to say about it. According to Mr. James Dunn, a New Testament scholar, nearly all modern scholars consider the baptism of Jesus and his crucifixion to be historically certain. He states that these two facts in the life of Jesus command almost universal assent and that they rank so high on the almost impossible to doubt or deny scale of historical fact that they are obvious starting points in an attempt to clarify the what and the why of Jesus' mission. Interesting. Now, another one. He says there the, that the crucifixion of Jesus is a historical fact. And he states that based on the criterion of embarrassment, that Christians would not have invented the story. It wasn't a very good story to invent, that your leader, who was supposed to save you from all your sins, himself died a very embarrassing death on the cross. Another historian, Amy Levine, has summarised the situation by saying this, there is a consensus of sorts on the basic outline of Jesus' life in that, most scholars agree that Jesus was baptised by John the Baptist and over a period of one to three years debated Jewish authorities on the subject of God, that he gathered followers and that he was crucified by the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate who officiated Rome between 26 and 36 AD. We could go on, but I think there we have that the death of Jesus Christ and more specifically his crucifixion by order of Pontius Pilate is not Christian fable. It is not made up. It is a matter of historical fact. We can be certain that the events we're speaking of tonight, ladies and gentlemen, most definitely did happen. And not only, not only does history prove these prophecies in Isaiah to be accurate, but if we look at the rest of Scripture, we will see that the Bible gives us more than just the event. The Bible gives us more than just a historical narrative. The Bible gives us the why. So now we've established that. In order to begin answering our question, why did Jesus Christ have to die? Why was it necessary for him to die? Let's look at the big problem. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, in Matthew chapter 19, points us back in verse 4 to the very beginning of, of Genesis chapter 1. He makes reference to the very first three chapters of the Bible. And he says there, Have ye not read 
He which made them made them male and female. So let's go back there. If you don't mind, let's start by going back to Genesis chapter 2. We'll go right back to the very beginning of the Bible and we'll have a look at where it all started. Chapter 2 and verse 16. It's up there on the screen for you. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So it started well. God creates Adam. He, he puts him in the Garden of Eden and he gives him a law, a law to follow, in that he was able to eat whatever he wanted, but he was not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and that there was to be a result if he did. But if we read down further on to the next chapter, we find that after a period of time, Adam and Eve ended up breaking that law. Adam and Eve transgressed God's law, and their sin resulted in death, just like God said when he laid down the law in chapter 2, verse 16. God has said that if they disobeyed the law, they, they were going to die. When we get to chapter 3, we find that there was a serpent who was, the, who was an animal endowed with the power of speech. And he tests Eve and he says, you're not surely going to die. It was a direct contradiction to God's law. It was a direct contradiction to the words of God. And Eve believed the serpent rather than God and, and drew Adam into the disobedient act. We know the story quite well, I'm sure. When we go to the New Testament, we find in 1 John 3 verse 4 that transgression or disobedience to God's law is sin. So Adam and Eve had sinned, and as a result, they had created a distance between them and God. They had alienated themselves from God. And as a result, true to God's words, Adam and Eve were condemned to die, to return from the, to the dust from which they were created. Commenting on the situation, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 says, Wherefore as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We'll look at that reference a bit later, but it's ref if you're writing it down, it's Romans 5 verse 12. And so as surely as the sun rises every morning, Adam's sons were going to be like him. Adam's descendants were going to be like him. They were going to possess a nature with a tendency to behave as Adam had, a tendency towards sin, a mortal nature, a dying nature. And so all mankind ever since has suffered the consequences of sin. And those consequences, as we know, as we've just seen, are death. And if we're in any doubt as to whether or not that's just an isolated idea, we can have a look at some more verses. And there's a few of them there for you. Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5. We just, we just mentioned it. So death passed upon all men. For they have all sinned. Romans 5.19, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. There's a direct cause and effect linked between sin and death. Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. It's a very clear Bible principle. We will find it all throughout the pages of God's word. And so we have a huge problem. We have a problem that started back in Genesis chapter 3. And ever since then, the law of sin and death has reigned. As a result of the sin in the Garden of Eden, where mankind have been living and suffering and dying, completely helpless, completely unable to do anything to escape that cycle, completely powerless to undo what was done back in Genesis chapter 3. And so when we think about it and we realise how how helpless we are, we can appreciate the seriousness of the problem that exists. And if we were to read on in, in Genesis chapter 3, 
There's some verses up there for you from Genesis chapter 3. If we read on in Genesis chapter 3, we f what we find is that Adam and Eve tried to come up with a plan to try and cover up their sins. They tried to, tried to come up with their own solution. They tried to make it all go away and, and patch it up and make it go back to how it was. We see there that chapter 3 and verse 7, and the eyes of them, that is Adam and Eve, were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves aprons. Unfortunately, though, they soon found out that that's not how it was going to work. They soon found out that they were not able to just patch this up. They were not able to make it go away. They were not able to provide their own covering. Their solution was not going to work. But we might ask ourselves the question, if we're unable to do anything about it, if we are unable to help ourselves, if the law of sin and death continues to reign and there's no way out, what possibly could be the solution? Well, for the, for the solution to the problem, we need to read on in Genesis chapter 3 because when we get down to verses 15 to 21, we find that God himself provides an alternative to Adam and Eve. We read there in verse 21, as highlighted on the bottom for you, unto Adam also unto his wife did God make coats of skin and clothe them. The, the covering of fig leaves was not going to be enough. It wasn't going to be adequate. There is nothing that they could have done about the law of sin and death. And yet we know from scriptures like Second Peter 3 that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want us to remain without hope. He doesn't want us to just be stuck in a cycle of sin and death. He doesn't want any of us to die. He wants us to live. He created us for his glory. And so he provides a solution. And we can read of his solution there. And we'll just read those verses now before we, before we continue. God says, and he's speaking to the serpent here in verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, until thou, thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did Yahweh make coats of skins and clothed them. So God provided coats of skin, coverings made from the coats of an innocent animal that had to die, an animal that had to die for that to happen. This was the punishment for their transgressions. This was the results. Not only were they just going to die, they now had to go and suffer and experience pain and hunger and hard work and exhaustion. They were going to start feeling the effects of mortality. And so an animal had to be killed. An animal had to be slaughtered and blood had to be shed to provide the covering that was going to be acceptable to God. There was a sacrifice of animal life. It, was a, it, it taught them a lesson, it teaches us a lesson, that sin merits death and can only be atoned for by the shedding of blood. We read about that in Hebrews 9, in the New Testament, verse 22, where it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin, of sin. The animal's skin 
that was used to cover Adam's sin was, was about far more than just Adam's sin. It was about far more than just the animal that was killed. The animal's skin, it represented God's plan to permanently undo this disaster, to permanently solve this problem. The problem that was caused by sin that allowed God to still adhere to his original stated sentence, which was, thou shalt surely die. So in these words of Genesis chapter 3, ladies and gentlemen, there was a promise of salvation to come. A promise that there was going to be a man, a man of Adam's race who was going to succeed where Adam had failed, a man who was going to obey where Adam had disobeyed. And in the words of Romans, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And that man as we learn from the pages of God's word, including Isaiah chapter 53, was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one who succeeded where Adam failed. And even as the writer to Hebrews chapter 4 verse, says, 4 verse 15 says, he was tempted in all points like we are, and yet he committed no sin. And it was because he was without sin it was because he was a perfect sacrifice that the shedding of his blood as a sacrifice for sin was God's grand plan to redeem us from the consequences of Adam's disobedience, the consequences of sin, which is death. If we will continue to read through the book of Genesis, we find that animal sacrifices were offered by, by many righteous people people who desired reconciliation with their God. We read of Noah offering sacrifices, Abraham, Jacob, many others, men who understood that the animal was not guilty of any sin. That animal that died was not under any law. The animal was just a figure. It was a symbol of the coming Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world, as we see there in John Chapter 1, verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God, says John, which taketh away the sins of the world. And God was pleased to accept those men, for they acknowledged that they were sinners and that they were fit only to die. But God accepted those sacrifices if the men who offered it realized that it pointed forward to something else, that it pointed forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was provided by God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, we won't turn there, but Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 explains this principle very clearly. It explains for us that this system of animal sacrifice was, was only a shadow of things to come. It was not the image itself, so to speak. It was not God's solution. The animal sacrifices could not make people perfect. The animal sacrifices could not make us perfect. It was just a symbol that pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ who would take away the sins of the world. But there's, there's a couple of verses we've looked over back in Genesis chapter 3, which I'd like to just touch on quickly. Verses 14 and 15. And it's this idea of enmity. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's a conflict predicted here. A conflict with profound allegorical meaning. The serpent, as we see from the rest of scripture, is used as a symbol for sin in other parts of the Bible. And... And if you want an example of that, you could look at Matthew 23, verse 33, where evil men are spoken of as the descendants of the serpent. And so there's two seeds from this point on. There's the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Two seeds, two different types of people. And these two seeds, or these two different types of people, if you like, were going to have an enmity between them. There was going to be a conflict. There was going to be some sort of antagonism between them, a conflict 
that was only going to be ended by the destruction of the seed of the serpent. But that victory over sin, the destruction of the seed of the serpent, was not going to be without a struggle. In the process, the, the serpent seed was going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. The Lord Jesus Christ's victory over, over sin was not gained without a fight. In the course of his victory, he suffered. We read of some of those sufferings in Isaiah 53. As Genesis 3.15 shows us, the outcome was a wound on the heel for Christ. But the serpent seed was dealt a head wound, a fatal wound. The Lord Jesus Christ, though crucified as a sacrifice, had never submitted to sin during his life. And as a result, God raised him from the dead. And it was the resurrection from the dead that dealt the death blow to sin. And it was that, that was the triumphant climax of God's plan of redemption. And that is why Christ died. So we know from, we know from the references we've briefly mentioned and from Isaiah 53 that Jesus Christ was indeed the Lamb of God. He was indeed the one who was referenced all the way back in Genesis 3 verse 15. The one that was promised, the one that was planned by God all the way back from the beginning of time. He was the one who was represented by the animal sacrifices under the law of Moses. And we know that he did in fact die. But, but more than that, when we read through Isaiah 53, along with the gospel accounts of his death, we see that he wasn't just offered as a sacrifice. He was brutally tortured. He was... He suffered unimaginable pain. Even in his life, he suffered loneliness and despair and betrayal. Isaiah 52, verse 14, a few verses before the reading started, it says that his appearance and form was marred beyond more than any other man. And yet it pleased God to bruise him. Verse 14 of Isaiah 53. I'm sorry, verse 10 of Isaiah 53. And it pleased God to bruise him. How do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile what he went through with a loving and a merciful God? How do we reconcile a man who suffered all of that with a loving and a merciful God? How do we reconcile that as being necessary to provide a solution for the problem in Genesis 3? What does it achieve? What did the death of a perfect man achieve? Well, if it's that, and if, if that is where it ended, then it would achieve very little. Even the Apostle Paul in, the, in, the, in his letter to the Corinthians says that if we believe in a Jesus which died and that was it, if we believe that Jesus Christ was crucified and was buried and stayed in the ground, then our faith is in vain. It achieved nothing. If that's where plan, God's plan ended, it achieved nothing. But, but let's have a look at some other verses in the New Testament, verses which show us why it provided the solution, verses which show us that it was far more than just the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 9, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. So it goes way beyond just the death of Christ. God's solution was not just about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, that was, that, that was completely necessary to provide an atonement for sin in the shedding of blood. But it is more than that. Because he did not just die, he was raised back to life. Because he was the perfect offering, because he had never committed sin, the law of sin and death had no power over him. The scriptures tell us that the grave couldn't hold him. And through the power and the mercy of God, he was raised back to life. And we see there, Romans chapter 6, verse 9, that he lives. And death hath no more dominion over him. 
Not only that, but if you scroll down to verse 14, we find that we can be beneficiaries of this too. For sin shall have no dominion over us because we are no longer under law but under grace, the grace of God. There's many, many verses we could look at to reinforce and to re reiterate this concept. We'll just have a look at a few of them briefly. If you don't mind turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 13 to 22. But if there be no resurrection, sorry about that, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith also vain? Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are dead in your sins. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Powerful words, aren't they? Hebrews 10, verse 12. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, And this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, till he make his enemies his footstool. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. The Lord Jesus Christ himself talking, he says, Behold, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. They're just some verses. We could go on for a long time. But God's plan for salvation, ladies and gentlemen, went far beyond just the death of his son. God's plan for salvation was not just about the death of Jesus. And you and I can be beneficiaries of his death. You and I can have a faith and a hope of eternal life, not just because he died, but because more than that, he rose from the dead and he is now sitting at God's right hand, in his own words, alive forevermore. So if we go back to our lecture title, Why Did Jesus Christ Die? Jesus Christ died because he was the fulfilment of the promises God made to Adam and Eve over 4,000 years before his death. He died because he was the fulfilment of the prophecies that God made to his people through his prophets centuries before he was born. Jesus died because he was the sacrificial lamb that God had prepared to take away the sin from the world. Jesus Christ had to die because that was the way God was able to finally crush the seed of the serpent because that was the way that God was able to have victory over the law of sin and death because that was how God was going to atone for our sins. But Jesus Christ did not just die. He rose from the dead and it's his resurrection that allows us to become beneficiaries of his sacrifice. It is his resurrection that completes God's plan to reverse what was done in the Garden of Eden, right back in Genesis chapter, chapter 3. And it was his resurrection, ladies and gentlemen, that gives us a hope beyond the grave, a hope of eternal life, a hope that we too can be resurrected from the dead in the future. Have no doubt, have no doubt, Jesus Christ died for you and I. We consider the following as proof of that. 1 Peter 1 verse 18, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Hebrews 9, But now once he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 1 Peter 3, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, 
that he might bring us to God. And finally, a, a verse which I think sums up better than I ever could, the answer to the question, why did Jesus Christ have to die? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 10. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live with him together with him. And that, that verse right there is the answer to the question, why did Jesus Christ have to die? Well, he had to die so that you and I can live together with him. So what do we have to do to live together with him? Well, first we need to recognise the big problem. First we have to recognise that we need forgiveness for our sins. We have to recognise that we are part of the problem, that we need saving, that we are powerless and helpless to do anything to escape the law of sin and death in our own lives. And in the words taken from the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And if we do that, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, if we do that, we have a glorious future awaiting us. And when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, as he will, as king of the world, he will say to us, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I'd like to thank you for your attention and your consideration tonight. Thank you.